I want to do string theory, but I'm in doubt due to all the criticism on string theory. Should I do it? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to answer that question. It's a specific... So welcome to FEMAT's podcast. Today, our guest is Dr. Suvarat Raju. Uh, Dr. Raju did his PhD from Harvard under Shiraz Benwala. And right now, he is a faculty member at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Uh, he mostly works on black hole information paradox and bulk boundary correspondence. And he is a proponent of the approach named holography of information. So first of all, Dr. Raju, welcome to the podcast. It's great Thank to have you. Having you. Thank you. So, so before anything, uh, I want to ask... Um, about your active project. So what active projects are you indulged in right now? Oh, so most recently I've been thinking about different things. You know, we've been thinking about the decitor space. Uh, so I've been trying to understand, you know, how this thing that you just call holography of information, which is some general property of gravity, how that generalizes to decitor space. Uh, we are also thinking of, you know, observables in general, uh, both in ADS uh, and in DS, uh, which have to do with, uh, you know, uh, there's been this discussion of how uh, the algebra of observables in different cases with or without gravity is different, and we're trying to understand that in some other language. And uh, I guess the uh, other thing I'm also thinking of, which is also related to holography of information, uh, has to do with uh, uh, you know how how to I mean there's some how to make it work completely in flat space. Uh, so there are some some loose ends there that we are trying to tie up. So. But it's roughly true, uh, you know, just to say in a very non-technical way that uh, uh, some of my work really has to do with observables in quantum gravity, uh, which is a subtle and interesting topic. And these observables have interesting properties and we are trying to understand them in different settings. I see. Uh, by the way, uh, you know, you mentioned decitor space. That reminds me, did you see that recent paper by Burgess and Quevedo? where they are claiming that probably the God decitor in four dimensions from in string theory. Well, you know, uh, so the kinds of work that we are doing doesn't have to do with the issue of, you know, how can you embed a decitor space within some UV complete theory? Uh, so the kind of question we are asking is more uh, by taking an effective field theory approach. And this is kind of, you know, it runs is the theme where, um, you know, that runs through much of the work that I'm descri I described which is that, you know, we don't really understand the UV complete theory of gravity in our world. Uh, so the approach that we take is, you know, we try and look at low energy. Uh, hello? It looks like the connection. Uh, I'm not sure if, yeah, the connection got cut. But uh, it's yeah, okay. so we try, and, yeah, we try and look at the properties of low energy gravity. And then we try and make some reasonable extrapolations to the UV complete theory. So we try and say, if, you know, argue, for instance, that, now, you know, some properties of the low energy theory should extend robustly to the UV complete theory. And then we try and make whatever statements we can about, you know, observables in quantum gravity. Uh, but it's it's kind of important that much of the work that I described recently doesn't have to do with specific details of UV completions, whereas what you're referring to has to do with, you know, specifically the question of whether, you know, you can now uh, get from string theory models uh, a decitor space. I see. So uh, you did your PhD from Harvard under Shiraz Minwala. So how was uh, Shiraz as a supervisor? <laughs> he was great. <laughs> uh, you know, it's been a, it's been a long time since. Uh, so uh, so now you know I've known Shiraz much longer. I guess uh, after my PhD and before my PhD, but he was a great supervisor. You know, it was very nice working with him. Uh, he, in fact, I I I think I joined Harvard. Uh, because of Shiraz, I remember, you know, I, I was choosing between different universities in the U.S. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Shiraz called me uh, and, you know, I was just an undergraduate student. And it was, you know, kind of nice if someone calls you and tries to persuade you to to join. Um, and uh, uh, so it was, uh, yeah, so it was it was really great. You know, he was uh, he was a really, really great advisor. I had, I had a lot of fun in my PhD. I had a nice time. So in your PhD, you also did some work on uh, superconformal theories and index of superconformal theory. So how did you transition into black holes? Was there a time where you decided that, okay, now I want to work on black holes? Um, let's see. Uh, it's true that, uh, you know, uh, in my PhD, my PhD work was in, um, uh, you know, uh, counting su on supersymmetric partition functions in ADS-CFT. 
Uh, but uh, soon after my PhD, I started thinking about other things during my postdoc. I was a postdoc at the Harish Chandra Institute. And, uh, you know, I started thinking about scattering amplitudes first. And then along the way, I started thinking about, you know, uh, black holes and uh, bulk reconstruction, ADS-CFT. Uh, some of that happened, you know, in discussions we had with Kiriakos, who was a close collaborator, who was, in fact, a couple of years ahead of me at, at Harvard. Uh, so, you know, we started discussing these things and uh, we thought it was very interesting. And then we I started working on it. Uh, and yeah, and then indeed I spent several years working on that kind of topic. I see. So now I want to come uh, to your, um, you, you know, the approach that you, uh, you know, uh, advocate, which is holography of information. And the thing is that in that particular approach, uh, so in your or big paper lessons from the information paradox. Uh, you know, you describe this particular approach by saying that the information about the black hole interior is always available, you know, mm. outside. The thing is that this seems to be a very fundamental conclusion. So why do you think that this particular lesson took a long time to be learned? I mean, this information paradox is a very old thing. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's true. You know, first of all, in some sense, we did understand this in specific examples, um, but uh, you know you're right in some in a way that uh, a lot of what we are doing now, uh, you know, could have been done uh, much earlier, could have been done uh, several years earlier. Uh, in in some sense, you know, it's a very surprising conclusion, right? This this kind of statement that we are making, which is that you know, which one can show, which is that you know, in in a theory of gravity, information that's available in um, in any bounded region is also available in its complement. Uh, this uh, seems to be some, um, you know, it's a very surprising kind of statement because it's very counterintuitive if you think about you know, quantum field theory. So you think about, you know, how the world around us works. You know, generally, uh, you don't say that the information in this room can also be obtained by somebody making very fine measurements outside the room. Now, that is true. It's a true, true statement. Of, at least we think it's a true statement about our world. Uh, but, you know, the kind of accuracy and precision that somebody to make measurements on the walls of this room would require to determine what's happening in the middle of the room is something that, you know, is completely beyond the realm of ordinary experience. And in ordinary experience, you know, information is localized. There's some information here and it's not available somewhere else. Uh, so it's a very counterintuitive uh, uh, property, I would say. Now, uh, in uh, holography in ADS-CFT, uh, you know, we do have an example where a bulk theory of gravity is dual to a a different theory that's on the boundary. But sometimes, you know, precisely because, you know, locality is so intuitive, people would think of ADS-CFT as, a, you know, as a, as a duality between two different theories. Saying, you know, you have the theory in the bulk and you have the theory on the boundary. And, you know, those are, uh, it's not the case that degrees of freedom in the bulk at one point of time are encoded in degrees of freedom in the bulk, but near the boundary at the same point of time. So that's a, that's a very counterintuitive statement. And, you know, however, if you do think of holography carefully, you would see that you kind of reach that conclusion. And in fact, that's how we first reached those kinds of conclusions. You know, it was our initial work on the black hole information paradox and black hole complementarity, where we emphasized this feature of the black hole interior that you know, it was actually encoded uh, in the exterior. Uh, and, uh, you know, we first described this and discussed many of the properties of this kind of encoding in ADS-CFT. And now, you know, a lot of what we did then is become much more, much better understood as part of the standard story. And it was that that led us to, you know, then try and ask if there were general principles that that, are, that underlie this. But I guess roughly the fact is that it's, it's uh, you know, it's just something which is counterintuitive, which is why, uh, you know, it's still something that's surprising. I don't think everybody appreciates or understands this, this property, although I think people should. I see. So correct me if I'm wrong, but um, in your paper, in your review, actually, uh, you mentioned this thing that pure states are exponentially closer to, you know, mixed states. And therefore, the Hawking calculation is not enough to conclude that this particular, you know, uh, what, what how, how should I put it? This particular spectrum is coming from a mixed state because you can add some exponentially small corrections to, yeah. you know, um, may make it a pure state. The thing is that uh, I'm sure, the, I mean, of course, you know this thing that there is this result by Mother, which says that you cannot, you know, add small corrections to solve the information paradox. So how does this, you know, go with that? Yeah. Naively, it what, seems yeah. that. So what Mother is saying, I think it's a question of what you mean by small corrections. Yeah? 
So uh, he, what Mathur, what Samir Mathur is saying, and Samir Mathur did a lot of important work, you know, a lot of uh, what is called the firewall or AMPS firewall paradox was actually first understood by Samir Mathur. And his point was that if you look at the wave function outside, the full state, and you say, you know, you start with a state, which is a, you know, a, a direct product of entangled pairs. So you say, you know, the state outside to first approximation looks like spin zero outside, spin one inside, plus spin one outside, spin zero inside. So an EPR pair, and you take n copies of such pairs. Okay? And then if you try and add small corrections to that underlying microscopic state, you will never be able to get a pure state. And that is true. You know, in terms of the wave function, this pure state is orthogonal to any mixed state. You can't take a mixed state of this kind and add small corrections to the wave function and get, you know, a, a pure state. However, you know, that's a very different statement from the kind of statement we are making, which is that, you know, if you look at observables, like simple observables, like correlation function, you know, what Hawking actually computed was simple correlation functions, two point functions, or three point functions uh, of, uh, you know, the or low point functions of the black hole radiation. Those observables are very close between pure and, and mixed states. Okay, so there's no contradiction in saying that you have two states which are orthogonal if you take the inner product in the Hilbert space, but many observables are very close between the two states. So what Samir is saying is that, look, you know, the final wave function is orthogonal to what Hawking computed, which is true. Uh, which is very different from saying that you know the observables uh, in the in the state uh, are very close uh, to what Hawking computed because Hawking really did compute observables. Now the second point is that Samir is saying is starting with a description of a wave function which involves you know entangled pairs outside and inside. Now Hawking's calculation is simply not precise enough to give you that form of a microscopic wave function, and that kind of you know that's. That kind of assumption that degrees of freedom are localized outside and inside, that's just incorrect. You know, that you can see even in, in empty space. So maybe the point where we disagree with Samir is that Samir argues that, uh, you know, it should be the case that degrees of freedom should be localized the way they are in ordinary quantum field theory. You have degrees of freedom outside, you have degrees of freedom inside, and they should be, you know, separate. Uh, and he calls it the galactic principle or the solar principle, which is that, you know, uh, in, it should be the if physics here doesn't affect physics uh, somewhere else. But it's just a fact of quantum gravity. It's something you can show in detail that, uh, you know, it, in, in gravity, it is not the case that degrees of freedom here are different from degrees of freedom that go around. You know, for those who want to see this in much more detail, there's actually a very long correspondence, maybe like 50 page, pages or so. Uh, that's, uh, you know, is one of our uh, papers that we published a few years ago called a physical protocol for observers on the boundary to extract bulk information ads it was published in this journal called SciPost. and one of the good things about SciPost is SciPost allows for open discussion between referees and authors and samir was in fact the referee for the paper so people can go look at uh, you know a very long discussion if they want to uh, on on these issues but uh, you know, I think Samir is right, just to summarize, in one thing, which is that you can't start with a mixed state and add small corrections to the wave function to get a pure state. But, you know, where we disagree with Samir, so we are using small corrections in a different sense there. And where we disagree with Samir is that we don't think it's true that, you know, bulk locality should be considered to be an exact principle. So you shouldn't start with a local description of the wave function and then try to correct it. That's just not, not a good starting point. I see. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, but are you saying that uh, what you refer to as the split property fails in gravity, right? That's right. That's right. Exactly. So I the see. split property is, yeah, is, is one way of saying that that's indeed how I phrased it in one of our papers, which is that, you know, uh, in, in ordinary, uh, you know, this thing that we're talking of information being localized, the technical way to frame that uh, is uh, in quantum field theory is called the split property, which is that you can specify the state independently in one region and outside the region. Uh, and indeed, in theory of gravity, you cannot do that. I see. Um, uh, are you familiar with this double copy thing? So the that, uh, you know, gravity can be... Uh, in amplitudes? You yes. mean double copy in amplitudes? Yeah. Yes. So yeah. Uh, do you think that if this is true for gravity, then, you know, through double copy, it can mean something about gauge theories as well? Uh, I don't think so, because the double copy is a statement that, you know, if you compute some kinds of amplitudes in gauge series and you write them in a particular way, 
uh, then you know you can get the the gravitational amplitude roughly by squaring the gauge theory amplitude as as a more precise algorithm. But um, that's not quite what is the kind of question that is being asked here. The kind of question that's being asked here is about observables and operator algebras. In gauge theories, you know you don't have the split property is true. You can show that it's true. You know it is true that in the gauge theory you can specify the state independently in a region and outside the region. And the reason, the main difference has to do with the fact that in gauge theories, you have both positive and negative charges. So I can add, you know, even if I put positive charge in this room, I can put enough negative charge in the boundary of the room so that an observer outside thinks we are exactly in the vacuum. Uh, in fact, in a theory of gravity, you can't do that. You know, there's no such thing. If I put some mass in the room, someone outside the room knows that there's mass in the room because they can measure the flux and there's no way to cancel that flux. So there's a difference between gauge theories and gravity. This has to do also with the fact that there are local gauge invariant operators in gauge theories, but no such thing in gravity. I see. So one more thing that I want to talk about is that, so there is uh, this, uh, I don't know if I should call it a debate, but at least it's a conversation between you and Geoff Pennington. Uh, yeah. You know, so Geoff Pennington is a person who works on islands. So yeah. what I want to ask you is your opinion of the islands program. Now, there are some criticisms of this program as well. There are a lot yeah. of proponents of this program as well. So what yeah. are your thoughts on the islands program? So, you know, it depends on how you frame it. Uh, the islands, you know, so uh, soon after Hawking's uh, paradox, or not soon, you know, uh, some years after that, uh, in, in the 90s, uh, you know, Page wrote a paper saying that, well, you know, if you expect unitarity to hold, then the entanglement entropy outside should follow a Page curve. So, you know, he said information should go inside and then it should come outside uh, in, a, in a certain way. Uh, you know, it should, it should first be lost and then it should be recovered with the radiation. And this seemed like a very plausible thing if you believe that, you know, because that's what would happen in a quantum field theory. If you had a box and you threw a lot of stuff into it, in a quantum field theory. And first, that stuff would be lost from outside. And then if you opened the box and allowed it to leak radiation outside, it would come, that information would come back outside. So if you have this in, you know, this intuition that information is localized like ordinary quantum field theories, then you would believe the page curve. And in the 90s and so on, you know, people, uh, many people, influential people in the community said, well, you know, to solve the information paradox, you need to derive the page curve. Okay, so this became something, some, something of a gold standard. Now, you know, if you think carefully about what we said in the beginning in holography of information, you'll see that you shouldn't in a theory of gravity expect a page curve because the information is always outside, doesn't go inside. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, so I think that's true. I don't think there's any disagreement about that. And what was done in the recent computations was that to some extent, the question was changed. You know, a different kind of question was asked, which does give the answer to be a page curve. And the question that was asked was, you take a black hole in, in, in uh, well, you take a black hole in, in ADS and that is dual to some conformal field theory. And you take that conformal field theory and couple it to a bath. And then in that bath, which is a non-gravitational bath, you ask for you know entanglement entropy between one part of the bath and the other part. And that of course follows a page curve. That's a completely non-gravitational question. And you can compute that using a calculation in the bulk, which involves islands. And, and I think there's, that those are nice calculations. There's nothing wrong with those calculations. Uh, the only objection I have is that what is being computed is not what we would call you know, the page curve of the black hole radiation. Uh, and you know, that's not how you should expect information to emerge in a real black hole in our world. So uh, uh, you know, I, don't, I, don't have, I don't think there's any technical disagreement between the fact that you know, if you set up the models that they have, you get, you get a page curve. Uh, but in those models, you know, what happens is by virtue of adding the bath, you know, the way you should think of those models is you have gravity in some region and then gravity switches off and then you have a bath. Uh, and, you know, by virtue of doing this funny thing where you switched off gravity, it turns out even in the region where gravity is dynamical, gravity becomes massive. And as a result of this, you're able to define, you know, obtain a page curve uh, because, you know, massive gravity has different properties. So I don't think there's any disagreement between, you know, the fact these calculations are correct, but I just don't see that, you know, mm -hmm. they are the right way to think about realistic black holes. I think if we, you know, I think this page curve is kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of saying, well, you know, we had these notions of locality, which is what we talked about at the beginning of, our, of information. And we kind of want to force that black hole should conform to that. 
And if you insist that, you know, the answer should be a page curve, you can ask the right question so that the answer becomes a page curve. But I think you're missing like the most interesting aspect of physics uh, if you if you do that. So that that's that's what I would say. You know, I don't think there's anything technically wrong with the island proposal. I just don't think it's the right physical question to ask for black holes. I see. Or, or realistic um, black holes, right? where, you know, you don't have a non-gravitational bath and massive gravity and so on. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, one thing that I got reminded of because of your answer is that, um, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you, uh, you have demonstrated in your review that there are no paradoxes when it comes to black holes in asymptotically flat space times and small black holes in ADS space times. But when it comes to large black holes in ADS space times, there are some problems. So can you, uh, you know, describe what yeah. the pro those problems yeah. are? Thank you. So, you know, these are actually a separate stream of the black hole information paradox. You know, black hole information paradox is used very broadly. Uh, the first uh, way it's used is in terms of the Hawking's original paradox. And I think this uh, understanding that, you know, the no hair theorem fails and information is localized unusually rather comprehensively resolves th that version of the paradox. However, there are some other paradoxes that were discussed a lot about maybe 10 years ago, uh, starting with this firewall and other things. And some of that discussion, in fact, has been forgotten. And even though I think that's actually, you know, pretty deep. And that discussion has to do with large black holes in anti de Sitter space. Now, large black holes in anti de Sitter space are different from, uh, you know, black holes in asymptotically flat space because they dominate the microcanonical ensemble. What that means is if you take some states at a typical energy, then it's likely to be a large black hole. Okay? That doesn't happen for asymptotically flat black holes. You know, if you pick states at a given energy, you're not likely to find a black hole. Most of them are likely to be just a gas of, you know, dilute gas of Hawking radiation. Uh, so now it turns out that for those cases, we can ask questions about what are the observables in the interior of the black hole? And, you know, are those observables state dependent or not? And uh, those, those questions, you know, in fact, haven't been completely answered. And uh, uh, they are indeed some subtle and deep questions. And in fact, uh, some, something which is uh, sociologically perhaps a little annoying is that I feel those questions are somewhat deeper than questions about the page curve and the naive Hawking paradox, but uh, uh, very few, you know, very few people are working on those, uh, even though they're kind of, I think, central to, you know, how we understand observables and quantum gravity. So can you briefly describe that, what are the problems if the observables are state dependent? Well, you know, state dependent, well, um, so... The first question is you can ask is, you know, if you look at typical states in, in in these typical large black hole states, do they have a smooth interior or not? You know, we, we write down the way you are introduced to black holes is we write down a Schwarzschild solution and then you draw a Penrose diagram. In that diagram, you have a horizon and you have the interior and there's nothing at the horizon. You know, there's a smooth interior. You can kind of have an infalling observer who falls smoothly through. Is that correct for a typical black hole in, uh, in ADS? Uh, and that's the first question you really need to ask. If you want it to be correct for a typical black hole in ADS, then it turns out that, you know, the observables have to be state dependent in that the correct observables to describe the interior have to depend on what the microstate of the black hole is. Now, that's something which is very unusual because, you know, in quantum mechanics, usually that's not how we think of observables. We think of observables as being some linear operators that are defined once and for all in the Hilbert space. Uh, but, you know, in quantum mechanics, we are often thinking of you know, how you can probe a system from outside. Uh, whereas in the case of black holes, an observer falling in, it's kind of a different setup because there you're asking questions about an infalling observer who's not outside the system. So we somehow need to understand these questions about an infalling observer, which might be important also, you know, for understanding cosmological questions and, and you know, other aspects of uh, quantum mechanics. So. So, uh, uh, you know, it basically has to do with the fact that state dependence is unusual because it suggests that the correct observables depend on the microstate, which is not usually the case in quantum mechanics. So this problem of state dependent observables is not there for small black holes in ADS? Yeah, it, at least there's no argument that it should be there for small black holes. And that's because the arguments for state dependence all rely on, you know, on asking questions about typical states. So small black holes are not typical states in the microcanonical world. And, you know, if you just want to describe a smooth interior states, in fact, small black holes are exponentially atypical, uh, then that's fine. There's no problem with that. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's also true of black holes in asymptotically flat space. 
So uh, this is uh, so the subtlety really arises when you ask questions about typical states. Okay, so uh, you know, I think some months ago we also had Samir Madhur on the podcast, and he talked a lot about his fuzzball paradigm. And you have a paper uh, which is a critique on the fuzzball paradigm, and you know that paper was, was actually very interesting to read, to be honest. Uh, so in that paper, you know, you talk a lot, uh, you know, a lot about the problems that you have with fuzzballs. So one thing that was very interesting to read was that you say that. Uh, you know, the first balls that are being studied are atypical microstates. They are not typical microstates. And then right. you also consider the possibility where if, if these atypical microstates are the basis of some more general states, and yeah. you also, you know, establish that even that can't be the case, right? So the question that I want to ask you is that... Um, is there something that the fuzzball people are missing? Or do you think that this total program is... Well, yeah. so this is something that, uh, I mean, I don't, it's a question you should ask Samir. But, uh, you know, the question that I think the Samir needs to answer clearly, which I've actually I never understood the answer to, it's a very straightforward question, which is take a typical state, right? We, we just talked about typical states. What is the experience of an infalling observer? Do they go and meet some fuzz at the horizon? Or do they go through and see nothing at the horizon? If the answer is they go through and they see nothing on the horizon, then there isn't much of a fuzzball we're talking about, right? Then, then there isn't, you know, if you're going to say that actually it's the way function of the microstate that kind of differs, then I would agree with that. You know, that's what holography of information tells you too, that you look at the full wave function and that actually has all sorts of fine-grained features even outside the horizon that keep track of what's happening. Uh, but the fuzzball, the name fuzzball suggests that, you know, as you go to the horizon, you kind of meet some fuzzy stuff which is not 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 the vacuum and indeed in these microstate geometries that people have found and they found a lot of solutions it is like this you know there's the, the, there isn't a horizon rather what happens is you know one space kind of caps off before you reach the horizon so those uh, geometries are really different from the typical from the black hole geometry and those geometries indeed you know cannot be typical and they can't even form a basis as you just said uh, now, one of the things that people say is we should have called our paper a critique of the microstate geometry program and not a critique of the fuzzball program because they say that, you know, uh, there's this program by Yusuf Bena and others who try to look for explicit solutions. And the fuzzball program is somehow more general. It's saying, well, you know, those solutions are just examples, but there's this paradigm that you get, which is fuzzballs from those solutions. Uh, so maybe, but you know, if those solutions are just examples, it's not clear what we learn from those solutions, apart from the fact that they're interesting solutions, you know, we can keep finding them, but it's not clear that they teach us much about black holes. Right. And, you know, if, if the fuzzball paradigm is more general, then I think the, the central question, it's a key question that they need to answer is, what does it really mean? What is the fuzzball paradigm? Are you saying that, you know, there are some very fine grained observables, which are exponentially precise, which are different outside the black hole, uh, sure, then everyone would agree with that between different microstates. Now, the question is, what is the expectation value of the metric in a typical state? Is it the Schwarzschild metric or is it not? It's a pretty clear question, right? You look at expectation value of G mu nu in a typical state. And uh, I think the answer is it must be, you know, the Schwarzschild metric. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, that's a that's an answer that you know I've we've talked about this for somehow fifteen years, uh, but I've never been able to get a very clear answer to this question. Uh, so yes, yeah, I I, yeah. Uh, it's, a pretty, yeah it's a pretty it's a straightforward question. If there are people who work in the first ball who listen who are listening to this, you know, I would invite them again to just contact me and tell me what the answer is. You know, what's the expectation value of G mu nu in a typical black hole microstate? I see. You also argued in the paper that. Uh, you know, the fuzzball solutions that are relevant for the black hole information paradox should yeah. not have, uh, you know, uh, you know, structure at a macroscopic level. It, they should also yeah. have a structure at, uh, you know, how should I put this, at, at a Planck scale outside the horizon. Yeah. So yeah. is that also one of the reasons why you're saying that they are not relevant for black hole information? You know, if, if, the, if the structure is going to be at the Planck scale, what does it mean? You know, we don't, usually you don't speak of the metric at the Planck scale. So if you're going yeah. to say the structure is a Planck scale in there, you know, you're not saying, I mean, I know you're not, you shouldn't be using words like metric and so on. So there, there is a, a, so, and so what we showed is that you couldn't have structure at large scales, at order one scales outside the horizon. If you had that, then these, you couldn't get typical states. 
and you couldn't even get a basis of typical states. And if you're going to talk about structure at much smaller scales, like the Planck scale, then you shouldn't talk of a metric. So, you know, uh, the, the question really is, you know, if the fuzzball people accept that for simple observables at an observer measures, like the expectation of the metric or two point functions of the metric and so on, whether you see what the Schwarzschild geometry shows you. And if they agree with that, and if their point is that, you know, if it's only if you look at very high point functions or so the full wave function that you'll see a difference, then I would agree with them in that. That's what, you know, holography of information also says. Right. Uh, uh, well, so one thing that I uh, didn't find in your paper, or probably it's there, I missed it, uh, you know, is about the original motivation of the first ball program. So I think uh, Samir was saying that uh, when he found these solutions in string theory that were, you know, without a horizon, those solutions were actually the original motivations for first balls. So, you know, if these solutions exist, and if you think that first ball, prob you know, paradigm has some problems, then, okay, what is the interpretation of these solutions then? Well, you know, first of all, some of these solutions that were found originally were for the case when the black hole classically had no horizon at all. So mm -hmm. perhaps it is correct that in that case, you can find black holes which, you know, have uh, horizons which are strings, you know, if you look at it a bit in string theory, you can find some black holes which have, uh, you know, you should replace that with some, some set of uh, uh, solutions which have, uh, I don't know, string scale horizons. But that's not the same as a Schwarzschild black hole. That's the case where, you know, you have classically, you have a black hole that has no horizon, it's basically singular. And then you say, well, you know, therefore string scale corrections will kind of resolve the singularity and give you something else. That's very different from saying you, you have a, you know, that in effective field theory, uh, you know, if you start with something that's singular in the absence of, uh, you know, then you can understand that there'll be small corrections to it. But if you look at a Schwarzschild black hole, effective field theory tells you you shouldn't have, you know, big corrections to the, at the level of the horizon. So, you know, to extrapolate from saying, well, you know, you had some solutions that you found that corrected something at string scale when the original solution was singular, to say, well, you know, you should look at Schwarzschild black hole and say, that's also a fuzzball. That's that extrapolation that I don't think makes is valid. I see. I hope I'm not okay. misrepresenting things, you know, but this is just my understanding of the fuzzball proposal. It's really the fuzzball people mm -hmm. who, should, yeah, who should explain this. Sure, sure. I, I'm just asking about your thoughts. Yeah, so yeah, I think yeah, that yeah. that should be fine. Okay, so I think uh, uh, we, we can go for a long time, but uh, since we have a limited time, so the thing is that uh, when I announced this podcast, some people asked me some questions okay. to ask you. So okay, I can sure. ask you some questions. Sure. Uh, I hope that we will be under time. Okay, yeah. so one question that I received was that I want to do string theory, but I'm in doubt due to all the criticism on string theory. Should I do it? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to answer that question. It's just this, you know, well, so... First, let, let me say, you know, uh, the, well, okay, so, uh, you know, first of all, uh, 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 let, let me start it at one end. Uh, let, let me say, you know, something about the criticism of, of string theory. Yeah? So some of the criticism of string theory is, is really a criticism, for instance, a criticism by Peter Voigt and so on is a criticism of a rather old notion of string theory that, you know, in fact, people like me never subscribe to. So it is true that, say, in the 80s or maybe the 90s and so on, you know, people thought that there's a very reductionist approach. You know, we have 17 more, uh, you know, parameters in the standard model. We are going to take string theory and we are going to find some overarching mathematical principle that will fix all these parameters for us, right? That will give us the theory of everything. And indeed, you look at you know some popular books by Brian Green or some popular descriptions by string theorists in the 90s. They were kind of saying it this way, right? Now, when by the time I entered graduate school, I heard some of this stuff, but I actually never took it seriously. It never seemed to make sense to me that we are going to guess some mathematical principle that's just going to fix all the, everything, the whole universe for us. Okay? Uh, so uh, uh, now uh, some of the criticism that has come out has been criticism of this. You know, if you look at, yeah, as I said, Peter Voigt is a classic example. Uh, maybe Sabine Hosenfelder and others, you know, they, the, this criticism is, oh, look, you know, the unification program doesn't work, or has failed. Um, and, uh, sh you know, sure, but that program has kind of, you know, it's that's 20 years out of date, like that criticism might have made sense in, in the 90s or something. So if you go to the strings conference, uh, you don't find any talks on unification, you know, I mean, fine, yeah, it's, you know, maybe some, some people still subscribe to that. But Honestly, you know, from my generation, we never subscribe to it. 
Now, some people say, oh, you know, but the leaders of the field haven't taken that back. I, that, I think that's meaningless. You know, maybe the people from an older generation, some of them who still believe in it, but at least that, right? people like me never subscribed to it. Now, that criticism is valid, but I think it's not relevant, you know, because I don't think that's what most people are doing. Uh, what most people are, what people like me are doing is, you know, string theory is, turns out to be a very useful tool to understand correct statements about quantum gravity. You know, what happens when you put quantum mechanics and gravity together? At the beginning of this talk, for instance, you asked me, uh, you know, why did people not guess this answer? You know, why did people not understand holography of information earlier, which is some statement about quantum gravity. And I think the answer is that it's a very surprising statement. And in the end, it took the fact that we had these examples in string theory where something like this was realized for one to realize that this is a general property of quantum gravity. So string theory is very good at producing very true and surprising statements about gravity that later we think, you know, might tell us something correct about the real world. Uh, so in that way, you know, it's certainly something which we should, which one should learn because if one wants to ask questions about quantum mechanics and gravity, which are deep and interesting questions, uh, then string theory is one thing that tells us, you know, uh, it has is it's a machine for producing correct answers about quantum gravity. Uh, and I don't think that the critics have really engaged with, with that aspect. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's one thing. Um, and uh, so that's what I would say, you know, in the end, people have to decide. I, I think that the question of quantum gravity is very interesting. I was always interested in it because it seemed to be a very fundamental question. And, you know, it also lets you ask fundamental questions about quantum mechanics, which uh, without going into crackpot territory in a very concrete sense, like, you know, some of the questions you were asking earlier about state dependence and so on, are really questions about deep aspects of quantum mechanics, right? How does quantum mechanics look from the inside? Uh, what are observables and so on? And those are really interesting questions which you can ask in a very concrete setting if you think about problems of this kind. And we think we, we hope we're making correct statements about the world. Uh, because, you know, uh, so I think that's certainly something which, you know, is worthwhile and worth doing. Uh, and I think the okay. criticism of string theory, some of which is, is really referring to a program which was, you know, it's valid, but it's just referring to a program that was kind of dropped 30 years ago. And what's the point of going on about that? Uh, and, you know, to some extent, maybe it's it's true that there were some string theorists who oversold that program. And But, you know, I, I wasn't one of them and no one in my generation really was one of those. Okay. Okay, so the next question is that as a master student, I want to ask him what should be the level of mathematics to continue in theoretical high energy physics. Oh, uh, again, you know that really depends on the kinds of problems that people want to do. But uh, mm -hmm. at at uh, at a fundamental level, you know what's important to understand in the kind some of the kind of work that we do. What we tell our students is they need to understand general relativity very well, and they need to understand quantum field theory very well. Uh, so they need to be able to understand those two subjects really well. Uh, you know, there are, of course, more mathematical questions one can ask, uh, or there are less mathematical questions one can ask, but that those are kind of the basic prerequisites. I see. So the next question is that any physicists that you have worked with whose work ethic stands out to you? Oh, many, ma many people uh, whose, uh, whose work uh, stands out to me. Uh, you know, work uh, ethic. Whose work ethic? Yeah, work ethic stands out to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, you know that that's also there are many people I worked with whose work ethic uh, stands out to me. There are many of my collaborators who have you know uh, many different skills which I find uh, uh, admirable. Um, you know, uh, one of my current collaborators, uh, Alok Lada from Chennai Mathematical Institute. One thing I'm always impressed by is, uh, you know, his enormous understanding of the the literature you know he you tell him something and he'll say oh you know there's a paper by x and y which which dealt with this i'm like how did you know that uh you know that's a spoke, superpower yeah so we spoke of you know the kiriakos for example you know he had he had often had a would have a very deep understanding of something you know he'd read read something be able to understand it which i found impressive you know and many so there are many of my collaborators who who do things uh you know who uh, Shiraz is another example of, you know, my advisor, you know, he he taught me to be, he's someone who really taught me to be careful, you know, in fact, sometimes I wonder if I'm too too careful, you know, he, uh, in that, uh, you know, you, you don't write a paper where uh, uh, there are any, any, any errors, you know, you really make sure to be very careful, think about everything very carefully, you know, be really solid. Uh, 
uh, I don't know the other pay, other collaborators who taught me how how to you know handle PhD students, how to handle collaborations. I know they have learned a lot from a lot of collaborators. Every collaboration I'm in, I learned something. Okay, so the next question from the people. So this one is an interesting question. So the question is that you are one of the rare scientists in India who have been vocal on social issues. How do you manage your role as a public intellectual towards social issues? <laughs> well, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, it's something that I always kind of felt strongly about uh, even before I was a graduate student. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to some extent, it's not, uh, it's, it's not, uh, uh, it, you know, may, maybe purely in terms of physics, it would be better if if you did spend time on anything else and you just thought about physics. But I'm kind of not like that. You know, I find that if I uh, I find I'm affected by things that happen around me and I feel I need to take a stand if I, you know, on, on things I feel strongly about. So uh, I guess that's just, uh, and uh, I've always felt that I should, uh, you know, uh, I you know, I, I always felt I was, I was, uh, at least I, uh, I would, uh, yeah, I would like to be as active as possible in, uh, in, in also socially in the, in the world around me. And it's a hard balance to find and I've struggled with it at times, certainly, you know, as, uh, as a student and later also, you know, it's something, maybe now it's easier because now, you know, I'm older, but, uh, and, uh, you know, to, to find that balance and people need to find it for themselves. Of course, there's also the fact that not, it's not always appreciated. You know, uh, within uh, so often, you know, when you speak out on issues and you challenge uh, people in authority, uh, that is not appreciated, and uh, that uh, you know that has uh, so that has consequences at times, right? And you have to be willing to to handle that. Uh, so that's uh, you know, and creates trouble, and uh, so you have to then spend time handling handling that as well. Uh, and uh, that, that that you know, and one reason it. Ha and, you know, it's kind of unfortunate in some sense that the scientific community is uh, apolitical and disengaged often from important social questions. Uh, but it also means that, you know, for the few scientists who do try to engage with it, the response sometimes from people in power is, is much more ferocious than it would have been otherwise. You know, and that's because, you know, most people are, are apolitical maybe because they're socialized into being apolitical, but uh, the few people who do... Uh, you know who are active on on these issues uh you often you know uh, provoke a response which is completely out of proportion sometimes from people in 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 positions of authority uh, it never ceases to surprise me uh sometimes how uh you know and so that's that's uh, yeah so that's all those are all things that one needs to one needs to deal with uh okay okay so the next question is that uh apart from physics what are your hobbies <laughs> Uh, apart from physics and activism and, and stuff, mm, I don't know, sure. <laughs> taking, taking care of my kids, uh, running, <laughs> uh, I don't know, playing, yeah, uh, I play various things, uh, but yeah, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if I have, if I have, uh, yeah, uh, you know, as I said, I, I already, uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, okay. yeah. So the next question is that, to what extent do you read phenomenologist work in your field? Actually, unfortunately, not much. Uh, maybe I should I should read read more of it. Uh, but for mm -hmm. me personally, uh, you know, I've been kind of. Uh, it's true that you know, uh, some much of the work I've done has been a little disconnected from immediate phenomenological questions. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, we've we've tried to ask maybe questions which have to do with the basic structure of quantum gravity. Uh, rather than phenomenological questions. Maybe that's not the right way to proceed, but, you know, so at least in what I do, we haven't really, you know, in many times uh, made contact with the phenomenological literature. I see. So, uh, by the way, I think you already answered this question, but if you want to add something to it, you can add. So, yeah. one of your collaborators has been Kyriakos Papadodimos. Uh, how was you know, the experience of working with him? By the way, I also met him when I was in ICTP. He, he's a very, very good person. Yeah, very no, knowledgeable person. I, I I learned a lot from from Kira Kosa and I you know I, we still talk a lot. Uh, so it was it was really great. As as I said, I I learned a lot. You know, it was often uh, you know just discussing with him. He he as I said, you know he would he would get the point of many things uh, very fast, and uh, so I I really learned a lot by talking to him because you know he would he would get the point and he would explain to me what the point was. So, uh, so that that was uh. uh so you know, someone wrote a paper. He would, he would get, you know, 
he he thinks about things very deeply, so he understands uh, what 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 things are about. So it's it's been great, uh, you know, working with him. Yeah, I remember that when I was in SCTP, he was my go-to person for whenever I heard a criticism against string theory, I would go to him and he would tell me why this criticism is wrong. <laughs> that was such a good time, to be honest. Okay, so there's this question. It says that, um, is ICTS culture open to collaboration amongst different fields and departments? Yeah, I think so. In ICTS, in my institute. Yeah. yeah. First of all, we don't have departments at all. So, you know, it's a small okay. institute. Uh, but for sure, you know, I I mean, I talk to my colleagues all the time. Uh, and it is pretty open to, to collaboration with it. You know, sometimes it just naturally happens. The kinds of questions you're thinking of are a little different from kinds of questions other people are thinking of. Uh, so you might, you know, we might not be very close, but, you know, we talk a lot. I talk a lot to people in gravitational waves. I talk to people who do, who do, I was just recently talking to people who do probability. I talk to people who do, you know, st statistical mechanics. So uh, it's very open in that way. And there aren't actually any departments. It's all kind of one institute. So everyone talks to everyone and people have a sense of what other people are doing. So it's pretty integrated in that way. And what about TIFR in general then, not just ICTS? Well, TFR is much bigger, you know, TFR is not one institution. Uh, I mean, it is one institution, but has different centers. You know, there's TFR in, in Mumbai and there's in Bangalore itself, there are three centers of TFR, a Center for Applicable Mathematics and NCBS and TFR in Mumbai. There's also TFR in Hyderabad, there's NCRA in Pune. So there are many centers and all of them have their different cultures. And I have not really worked in uh, in uh, uh, in any of them except for ICTS. You know, I mean, uh, of course, I have friends in many of these other places and I visit them. But all of these are kind of little institutions in themselves and they have their own cultures and their own good and bad things about, about themselves. So, uh, I mean, I think TIFR in general is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a great place to, to do science. Uh, that's, that's a general uh, statement. And, uh, you know, uh, I've seen, there's some things that get coordinated at the institute level, right? With the uh, graduate coursework and so on, there's some minimum requirements which have to be met across the institute or, I don't know, even questions of promotions or appointments and so on. There's some institute-wide policies that are followed. And in general, the FR is, is very good. It follows, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good place. But the specific thing of whether people in one department talk to people in another department, that really probably depends on the center of the department. In ICTS, as I said, you know, people... Uh, collaborate and talk a lot. I see. Okay, so this is a general question about theoretical physics. It says that we have often heard that theoretical physics is biased towards talent in comparison to hard work. Is this true? I don't think that's true, actually. Uh, you know, uh, okay. uh, I, I, you know, I used to maybe th uh, think about think uh, about stuff like this when I was much younger, but a lot of what counts is. Uh, First of all, I don't even know how to define talent, you know, talent in what, you know, when you're, when you're younger, you kind of think that talent in physics has to do with solving some problems, you know, theoretical, solving whatever problems you get in the, I don't know, physics Olympiad, for instance. Uh, but that's not necessarily talent in research. And I, you see people doing well in research in very different ways. So talent itself is pretty multifaceted. It's not so easy to define. And, you know, sometimes there might be people who are very good at solving problems uh, of this Olympiad kind or people who are very knowledgeable, but who might not always do the best research. And, you know, you might sometimes meet people who are doing very good research and you might think, you know, this guy doesn't even understand this textbook stuff, but they still do good research. So talent itself is very complicated and very multidimensional. That's, that's the point. That's point one. And second... You know, in the longer run, what matters a lot are questions like motivation. You know, hard work in the end often has to do with motivation. You can't kind of force yourself to work hard. And uh, so, you know, those things like motivation, being interested in stuff and working on it and is important. Of course, I guess to some extent, talent must be important. You know, if there's somebody who just doesn't like maths or analytical thinking or physics and so on, then of course, you know, you don't expect they'll do theoretical physics, but talent is pretty multifaceted, I would say. And yeah, very broad. People can yes. do it in different ways, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think this is the last question then from people. So the question is that, how was your postdoc experience in HRI? I had a great time. You know, my experience is perhaps not typical. I was... Um, my experience probably even as a graduate student as a postdoc is not not very typical. Uh, 
uh, but I, I had a very nice time. I actually really liked Allahabad and I missed Allahabad. So I, I still miss Allahabad. Uh, so I, it's called Prayagraj now, but I'll, I'll, I'll mm-hmm. always insist on calling it Allahabad. Uh, so sure. I, uh, you know, I, I wanted to come back to India. So I was in the US for my PhD, as you said at the beginning. And very soon after being in the US, I decided I wanted to come back. But if it in fact was for political reasons, I was there at the time of the Iraq war. And I was spending a lot of my time doing anti-war activism. And I realized that, uh, you know, uh, uh, what I was saying kind of, you know, just didn't resonate with people there. You know, for me, just, you know, it didn't make, you know, I viewed the U.S. as this imperialist country that was, had no good intention of going in to, you know, bomb and kill people in Iraq for its own geopolitical reasons. And, and that just wasn't the starting point of people there. You know, there was just a completely different starting point. And it, I thought, you know, this is not even a good place for me to be an effective activist. Uh, what I say doesn't, you know, my starting point is very different from the starting point of people here. And that I just found very frustrating. So in fact, very, for that reason, very soon after I started my PhD, I wanted to come back to India. So I did that immediately in my postdoc. Uh, you know, it, it's not it's not the career move that advised, uh, uh, career people advise you to stay on in the US, but uh, I was very clear. I wanted to come back for this reason. And I did then. It, it was, you know, because I was doing that, I kind of, you know, my... Uh, my jobs and so on just kind of worked out. I was kind of fortunate. I never stressed much about them. And fortunately, everything just kind of worked out. Uh, but HRI was a nice place to work in. It's still a great institute. It's a beautiful campus. And uh, the city is also great. You know, people who come from metro sometimes don't like Allahabad. But Allahabad, in fact, is a very interesting city if you explore the city. Uh, and uh, not everyone in, in HRI as an institute does that. They sometimes live within the campus. But if you go out, it's a very interesting city. And, uh, you know, it's a, so I, I really enjoyed it and uh, I had a great time. Uh, and I, as I said, I still, I still miss it. So my experience was nice in HRI. Do you think that, uh, do you think that HRI is kind of a different place now since Ashok Sen is not there now? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't been, you know, I haven't really spent time. I haven't spent that much time there uh, uh, since leaving, you know, I, I go, I've gone back for visits. I went back, I guess. The last time I went back was uh, maybe a year ago. I, uh, yeah, so it's been some time since I've been there. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, I you know it's still a nice campus. But uh, may, maybe things have changed, you know. Uh, Ashok, Sumati, many other people have left. The new people have come in. Uh, so I, I can't. It's it's hard for me to say say anything about that. Okay, uh, sure. I, it's, I'm sure it's still a, it's still a great institute. You know, there's still many very mm-hmm. great people there. And uh, and uh, yeah, uh, things have things have changed, but I'm sure. Yeah, you know, if, if, when I go there, I still have a very nice time. I still enjoy my time there a lot. Uh, how it is to work sure. there, I can't. Say. I see. Uh, actually, it it was the second last question. There is a last yeah, question. Yeah, so, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. So, the, so last, I think I think we are still under time. I think we will. Yeah, 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 no so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question is that: What are you excited about this? Uh, you know, new way to express pi that came out of string theory. Uh, uh, um, uh, it was nice. I don't think that was the point of their paper, though. You know, mm-hmm, uh, yeah. was, uh, so they were trying to understand crossing, and it yeah. seemed to me that it was kind of a, uh, uh, you know, maybe I, I hope I'm not misrepresenting, but it seemed to me that the main physics that they're trying to understand is this, is the physics of you see. There's a broader question of how do we understand scattering amplitudes? What are consistent scattering amplitudes in quantum gravity? Or what are consistent scattering? What are the consistency conditions we should demand from scattering amplitudes? And how can we construct different kinds of scattering amplitudes? Can we maybe find consistent scattering amplitudes apart from the amplitudes that we know of? Right. So that's an interesting question. That's really the physics question that we're looking at. Now it's kind of cute that in that process, you know, one finds they found this representation. Uh, for the beta function, uh, and uh, that led them to this representation for pi. But that's kind of a cute side product, I felt. Uh, mm-hmm. And I felt that some of the uh, media, I, I saw there was some media coverage about it, and that I felt was a little, I don't know, I didn't, didn't. Uh, it's kind of focusing on the, I mean, okay, maybe that's how the media is. Maybe, maybe the people, popular press only understands pi. I don't think that yeah. was, that was what they were, what they were focusing on in their paper. The paper was about a different yeah, physics question, uh, not about a series representation for pi. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, 
Yeah, I, I am not the best person to ask because I haven't studied this, but it seemed to me a series representation for Pi was nice. Maybe historically it was interesting. It made some connection with the Madhav series mm -hmm. for Pi. And it's kind of nice that, you know, this comes out, but it's a, it's kind of a side note I, I felt rather than the main point. Okay. Okay, so I think my questions are over. Thank you so much for your time. It was very okay, nice to talk welcome. to you. Thank you. And I hope much. that we can do it in the future as well. Sometime. Sure. As well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Asa. Thanks. No problem. Thank you. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. And the YouTube algorithm thinks that you will also like this video.